Hello everybody, welcome to the session today. It's, it's nice to see some faces, uh, some familiar faces and some new faces. Um, yeah, welcome to today's session. Uh, so we're talking about um, AI and just by trying to explain what this picture means here. Basically what I just wanna uh, explain is that I'm not gonna be doing this in order to scare anybody. Um, it's not my intention to uh, convince you of anything, uh, but more so uh, the last couple of months, my uh, concentration has been primarily AI um, subjects. And I've done quite a bit of exposed to many, many concepts. I've been following different stories and different views about different ways of understanding what is AI and what is the direction that we're going through. And so what I've done for you today is to share the, the result of that research and that understanding. I collected uh, a few quotes, be a, a few definitions. Uh, there will be uh, clips from different um, interviews or events that I think are defining in order to understand just what is happening with AI and, and most importantly, I think, what, uh, what is most likely about to happen with AI. And so I, I'm doing this presentation for you today. Um, so yeah, so I already have said who I was, but uh, primarily um, I work at CEREC. Uh, my role there is uh, Director of Technology. Um, however, the main reason why I'm here is that I'm wearing my other hat, which is the Emerging Technology Fellow that I am of the Technology uh, Emerging Technology Fellowship Program initiative that Community Foundations of Canada has um, has envisioned, and so I've been I've been part of that for the last two uh, three months or so, uh, and yeah, we we, we want to explore how um, emerging technologies like AI, Web three, blockchain, just create like a big powers that different systems change, and we want to make sure that we are bringing our understanding to decide on ways that we can actually um, facilitate support on this realm. Uh, so we have a, a bunch of um, supporters, uh, partners. So at the bottom you see this center, the Community Foundation, CEREC, Middlebrook Social Innovation Fund, and, and, um, and yeah, you can see them all. Uh, they are our partners in this because we, we need that. Uh, we need to have partnerships. Um, so one way of looking or understanding what is it that, you know, people that like as the fellows, uh, think of supporting unfolding of technologies, one primary issue is digital equity and, and yeah, um, that could play out in a number of ways, um, could be like countries in the world just don't have resources to even barely survive that to think about that they will have a possibility of having some income to spend on uh, on devices that are very expensive or simply because really they just don't have the means um, access to education as well it's um it's a big one and simply there's no infrastructure sufficient in the world to give uh, a, a similar or at least average level uh, connectivity to many areas of the world just because you know geographically speaking it's remote areas and whatnot but anyways, all of that, all of that, um, all of those barriers happened, have, have happened. And AI only has the opportunity to accentuate uh, that reality if there's not, if not, there's some awareness of what actually could happen if nothing is done now. So some of these areas are education, cultural preservation, environmental monitoring. And yeah, the, the necessity to connect and identify all these areas is super important. And the topic of shifting of power, uh, I've done this graph, I used to capacity to draw the numbers uh, as of like this month. Uh, and what I wanted to illustrate here is how in today's world, the top five most valuable companies in the world, all of them in states, uh, companies, American companies, and they're all associated with artificial intelligence, right? So we have Microsoft, the funds, OpenAI, Apple, well, we know what Apple is, but you know, they recently announced their Apple intelligence uh, platform, which is also a partnership with OpenAI. 
NVIDIA that makes the chips, that makes the uh, artificial intelligence run. Google, because it's been a player for a long time in artificial intelligence. So, you know, the Google DeepMind is their lab. They, they produce Gemini, right? They have their, their models themselves. And then Amazon is here also because they invest heavily in Anthropic, which is basically like direct competitor of uh, OpenAI. So all of these companies are just, you know, they're valuable today because of AI. Like, let's just, let's be real, right? I didn't Google top most valuable AI companies. I, I Googled or in, in perplexity, I searched top five most valuable companies of the world, right? So that means that this is the reality right now. And if you, and I only put the top high, highest GDP, GDPs and G7 because just to have some reference, you know, like uh, we're looking at some of these numbers like Microsoft or AI or Apple, like, like to the three trillion uh, dollars and compare like all the way down to like France that has oh, barely three, three trillion. So it's like these companies are getting so powerful. They're at the level of a country in terms of like, if you want to assess amount of capital and measure. Uh, so yeah, it would be. Um, so yeah, so we, we, we like to think of, you know, how important it is for us to shape the technology, but also understand just how the technology actually shapes you. And, um, yeah, so this graph is supposed to illustrate the relationships that, uh, or the dynamics that sometimes and most of the times are prevalent in the social, uh, impact and, uh, the philanthropy sector is that. There are a number of different organizations, social impact organizations that are in all of these categories. And sometimes they encounter some common issues and common problems, like, you know, when the internet game or when AI is coming, the tendency is to work in silos. You know, you do your own thing. You don't really communicate as, you know, it's silos. So what we think today is that it's very important to not do that anymore. Because um, if you don't, if you do that, the all model, let's say, where we can just work in silos is totally fine. We're not going to be in a position to more effectively and more strongly uh, withstand the impact of what we're living through today in terms of the AI uh, acceleration. And in doing so, when you have, you know, this, this elements of collaboration and working together and putting our minds together. You also include the philanthropy and social impact, which is not being present. It's not present in terms of the shaping of AI. Uh, we're not going to have the impact. And the impact is we actually use AI to help us address some of the crises that we live today, um, rather than AI becoming one of those crises. You know, because we have enough crises, there are all types of crises. We need we need to use it, make sure that AI is not another problem of that. Uh, so in the, in the realm of you know, there's two types of AI people, right? And the one side you have what I call the, the, the this is of course a spelling mistake, right? Right? It says doomsdayers, no, doomsdayers, like doomsday, like doom doomsdayers, right? It's like the fatalist, right? The people who are like AI is going to kill us, like the Terminator scenario, you know, the AI is going to destroy us and yeah. And then the leapfroggers, uh, it's my term, I come up with as well. The term leapfrog is a term, valid term, but frogger, I'm just making the connection with the game. Like who knows, frogger? Uh, yeah, you, you. <laughs> um, yeah, so so the 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 leapfroggers are the opposite side, right? Like they're more like positive. They're, they're thinking about how AI has the potential to leapfrog a lot of situations, meaning a community that now because they have AI, uh, they could uh, you know innovate so much that they all of a sudden become a player in anything, whether it be science or any any area. All of a sudden, um, I mean, things like that can be positive things. Uh, and so I call them leapfroggers. But anyways, there's a split, uh, and it's important to not split because I am interested to know, you know, how people are in terms of approaching this. Or like people will be like more in the middle. I try to be in the middle, 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, anyways, I'm not going to spoil the, the surprises. So yeah, so we're talking about the day of our artificial intelligence. And I like to put these definitions because I want you to keep in mind that I'm going to be in a progression in terms of explaining, you know, adva future advances of artificial intelligence. I want to start like with these definitions as a basis. So we go from the bottom and we're going to go progressively more advanced as we go up, right? So this is like at the basic level, we are talking about artificial intelligence. And what is artificial intelligence? The ability to substitute a function of a task that a person will perform that now a machine can do. And you can program a machine. You know, you're not, you're not programmed. Yes, you're programming them. They're pre-trained. I'm sure you heard the name pre-trained, right? So pre-trained just means that it's, it's the, the, the element that you're interacting has gone through a process of machine learning that's capacity enough and then sufficient data to be pre-ready for pretty much anything that you want to set it to do. But you have to sort of like prompt it to do that. The, the word prompting, you know, that's why I need to prompt it to do that. The prompting is necessary, right? So that's, it. that's where we are right now, right? It's advanced. It's, it does amazing things, but you still need to prompt it. I'm not going to necessarily make decisions for you right now. And then uh, we're going to make a next jump. Uh, the next jump of artificial intelligence. artificial intelligence is right here. The next jump will be like AGI or artificial generative intelligence, which in my opinion is a misnomer. I think it shouldn't be artificial kind of anymore. Like the word artificial is like, yes, I mean, do you even need to say it at this point? I think it should be replaced with autonomous. I think the word here is autonomous. But another way to talk about it is that now we're talking about a, a AI that reasons and thinks like humans would. So, and this is where the split is, you know, people don't think, there's some people who think that this is a fantasy, that this is um, make-believe, that like, there's no way because of this, 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 technical things like talking about transformers and yeah, things that <laughs> we don't need to go into detail, <laughs> but, um, um, and then there are the people who are, who, who are saying that this is most likely what's going to happen. Uh, and they're very sure, certain about that. Some of these people that are saying that it will happen are people who have already worked at OpenAI and Google and seen things that most of us have not seen. Because what happens when you are in a lab is that you have access to things that have not been released to the public yet that you would have already seen. So this is like more information. We're talking about the more information, right? But they can't divulge it because they signed NDAs that prevent them from divulging. They can go into jail or they can go lose their stock because they have a stock. Uh, even if you work, you, you still, your stock is your investment. You take with you. When they left OpenAI, they take that investment. And so the NDA can notify the position of that investment. So they, they, they're not going to talk because they'll ruin, them, ruin themselves by doing so. So instead, what they try to do is find the ways to warn us somehow. And that somehow has been lately that a lot of these former employees have come out, uh, have been coming out uh, kind of publicly, publicly, like in podcasts and reading articles and papers and being on the news as whistleblowers, just to say, like, you know, we've seen things and we can't say what it is, <laughs> but, but um, we should be worried, right? And so I would believe more of those people, I don't know if you, but this is just how I think. I would believe more of the people who have been right there in the labs as of like a couple of months ago, I'm not talking about years ago, just a couple of months ago, like these people were letting, leaving the organizations, the companies in May, I said like beginning of May, around May 13th when ChatGPT all came out, uh, a couple of days after we got some people leaving. Right. So we're going to see some of them. We're going to meet some of them, uh, not on the flesh, but on the video. Uh, but I think one important thing to start with is to talk about who perhaps are, it's the biggest player of AI. And I think it heavily relies on the hardware, right? The chips, the processor and, and, and the compute power that is necessary to, to run AI. You need, you need the, the hardware. And so. I say the piece because it's like a couple of days ago or last week, Nvidia stock went up. Uh, it went to be like 
the largest company in the world, like overtook Microsoft. Microsoft has been at the top of valuation. Uh, but it's, it's taking over. So it's like, I, I think like NVIDIA might become actually the most powerful company, like way, 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 way past Microsoft. I think it has the potential to. If you just seen the growth in the last couple of years, just how it went in terms of its valuation, it's like speed up, like it's completely speed up. It's so interesting. But one thing to, to understand here is, um, you know, what, what is a GPU? So you might have a GPU. It's the processor, the, um, the chip that will allow, that is, that is perfectly suited for artificial intelligence running. It was not intended for that, right? Because the word graphic implies processing of graphics. And what are those graphics usually? Could be simple 3D images, but also very high-end. 3D rendering that those chips can do and to be able to render games. It takes so much processing power uh, within a small chip that, um, works, that works perfectly because that is the type of complexity and heaviness that these chips demand that are only simulated with the game, but now with artificial intelligence. So that's what Nvidia makes, right? So this is the type of thing that and we're going to show here. I don't know if we're going to watch it all depending on time. But uh, Jensen Huan was at the Computex conference in Taiwan this uh, month, actually. Um, and there was being, this is a one hour and a half keynote that I am not gonna, we're not going to watch it right now, obviously. But uh, we're going to, um, I, 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 I done a super cut, basically, of the thing. Uh, so what I want to do is we're going to watch it. It's simulation. It's math. It's science. It's computer science. It's amazing computer architecture. None of it's animated, and it's all homemade. For almost two decades now, we've been working on accelerated computing. CUDA augments a CPU, offloads and accelerates the work that a specialized processor can do much, much better. This is Earth 2. The idea that we would create a digital twin of the Earth, that we would go and simulate the Earth so that we could predict the future On Monday, the storm will veer north again and approach Taiwan. There are big uncertainties regarding its path. Different paths will have different levels of impact on Taiwan. Imagine 容许我向您介绍 NVIDIA Earth 2 一个利用AI物理模拟和电脑图形技术来预测全球气候的数位孪生 CoreDiff是NVIDIA的生成式AI模型 它在WRF数值模拟的基础上训练而成 能够以12倍更高的解析度生成零气模式 从25公里提高到2公里 这代表了区域天气预测的一个 uh, uh, Cross this incredible chasm This uncanny chasm of realism So that the digital humans would appear much more natural this is, of course, our vision. This is a vision of where we love to go. Uh, but let me show you where we are. Great to be in Taiwan. Before I head out to the night market, let's dive into some exciting frontiers of digital humans. Imagine a future where computers interact with us just like humans can. Hi, my name is Sophie, and I am a digital human brand ambassador for Unique. This is the incredible reality of digital humans. Digital humans will revolutionize industries from customer service to advertising and gaming. The possibilities for digital humans are endless. 
Using the scans you took of your current kitchen with your phone, they will be AI interior designers, helping generate beautiful, photorealistic suggestions and sourcing the materials and furniture. We have generated several design options for you to choose from. They'll also be AI customer service agents, making the interaction more engaging and personalized. Or digital healthcare workers who will check on patients, providing timely, personalized care. Um, I did forget to mention to the doctor that I am allergic to penicillin. Is it still okay to take the medications? The antibiotics you've been prescribed, ciprofloxacin and metronidazole, don't contain penicillin. So it's perfectly safe for you to take them. And they'll even be AI brand ambassadors, setting the next marketing and advertising trends. Hi, I'm Ima. Japan's first virtual model. New breakthroughs in generative AI and computer graphics let digital humans see, understand, and interact with us in human like ways. Hmm, from what I can see, it looks like you're in some kind of recording or production setup. The foundation of digital humans are AI models built on multilingual speech recognition and synthesis. And LLMs that understand and generate conversation. We have Ladies and gentlemen, this is Blackwell. Black, Blackwell is in production. Incredible amounts of technology. This is our production board. This is the most complex, highest performance computer the world's ever made. Blackwell. <laughs> Let's go. Go, 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 go. Okay. Demand for NVIDIA accelerated computing is skyrocketing as the world modernizes traditional data centers into generative AI factories. Foxconn, the world's largest electronics manufacturer, is gearing up to meet this demand by building robotic factories with NVIDIA Omniverse and AI. Factory planners use Omniverse to integrate facility and equipment data from leading industry applications like Siemens Team Center X and Autodesk Revit. In the digital twin, they optimize floor layout and line configurations and locate optimal camera placements to monitor future operations with NVIDIA Metropolis-powered Vision AI. Like massive amounts, thousands of, of chips, uh, with higher capa capa capacity than ever, right? Like, so if you look at the the way that this uh, CPUs and GPUs have been just scaling up, like within within this portion here, with the twenty uh, where we are twenty heading to twenty thirty, um, this is exactly where you see the the skyrocketing effect right here. As if we're living through this, right? This is Blackwell, the latest chip for Nvidia, the GPU. The best, the, the highest amount right now. If you want to just try to exemplify what this is trying to exemplify is that 
prior to any big hardware release of uh, GPUs or, or, or advancements in GPU technology, it always precedes a milestone in AI development, right? So I mapped down basically like from ChatGPT 2 to 3.5 to 4, some major hardware event that preceded such major innovation, right? So if I just, just follow them all, you can follow with your own eye. But the event that I just showed just happened in, in this month, right? So usually something happens in a month. And if you just look at this months in between, a couple of months in between, something will happen. So this means it's like we're in June, uh, by the fall or something, we should be able to see some major milestone happening because of this newly released technologies that are just multiplying the capacity for processing of, you know, the, the machines, right? So what I've done here, uh, actually like representing the robots, um, like what is one, one, <laughs> one petaflop, right? A petaflop is one quadrillion trillion floating points of operations per second. So it's just to indicate, you know, that the more uh, flops there are, beta or whatever, the more capacity for processing that these chips will have to be able to handle what they're able to handle, right? So in, in the last one, we had a uh, computational power of one petaflop, one. And the newly released, the one that came out in March, because the video that you just saw, that's June, that's this month, they already were able to duplicate what they released in March. So, so we went from 20 petaflops, and remember just a couple of years ago, it was just one petaflop at the maximum. But now we go from 20, from 20 trillion, quadrillion, sorry, from 20 quadrillion petaflops to 40 quadrillion. Uh, so computational power just keeps, keeps increasing. And these chips are not cheap either, right? I think like there are, should be like, I think I had it in a previous, if I'm not mistaken. No, I'm going to have it in the future. Uh, no, I, I don't know. I don't have it here. Oh, it's right here. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, 50K, like 35K or something like that. Like it's expensive. Like it's very expensive. So who has the capital to spend that much money? It's the question. So before getting too deep into it, I think I'd like to um, highlight that one of the things that I, that I, that we do is in the emergency technology fellowship is to look out for safety in AI and, and, and just think about that at least. Uh, that will be a priority is like, is this okay to think about? So recently the Prime Minister of Canada was at an episode of the Hard Fork podcast, which is a popular podcast in the States, I think. Episode 96, he showed up and they, they asked him about many things, but one of them was asked. So this is we are going to make sure we're keeping Canadians safe. Like I said earlier, um, AI for good done by the good people with thoughtful ways, with careful, rigorous oversight and transparency um, is going to be a very powerful tool to counter the AI for bad that we know is going to be out there. Yeah, so, yeah, of course, what is being said is, is very... Um, very good. Actually, this is the best part uh, that I like of what he said, and that's why I, I cut this clip uh, because I really like I like I like that in concept, you know. And, and for me, the troubling part is, you know, when politicians talk about something that sounds nice, but then the reality is they don't do anything significantly about it. And honestly, in my opinion, uh, when they did the federal budget this just earlier this year, um, allocating two point six billion dollars for AI innovation in Canada. And when you just think about the numbers I was showing when it's in the trillions, what is 2.6 billion against trillions of dollars? The type of capital that is flowing now is 2.6, not a, in my opinion, a drop in the bucket. We're talking about AI. Maybe. Okay, so so maybe. maybe we needed to have invested more on that than 2.6. Less in the military, for example, right? I think there was, I don't know how many, was it 30? Yeah, somebody can correct me. But it was a big, big, big number for defense that was invested. So maybe. Maybe it could have been more fair share to this thing that is so defining right now. I don't know. That's just my opinion. Very yeah, plain. Uh, so yeah. So given that, I think um, part of the reason why I wanted to talk about this presentation is um, that it's important to know more. Like it's basically important to go to the top of the mountain and have a overall view. The higher you go, you are, the more you'll see. So basically, to have an idea, a handle of many things 
and from that many things realization, formulate a strategy that you're going to undertake that is very comprehensive and, 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 and wholesome. Um, and so the way to look at it is that CIFAR, um, I always forget the name, but like uh, they do advanced research, it's just a very short, um, uh, short form of that. It's an, it's an institute that looks after advanced research. So one of those things is, of course, um, AI now. So this is the organization that is the umbrella for what is the, eco the current ecosystem of AI uh, research, but also for which, you know, in conjunction forms the strategy, the Canadian strategy. And now the problem with this approach is that it's completely missing something here. <laughs> There's a very important player who in other countries is present, but for some reason in Canada, it isn't. So uh, I don't know if you spot what, what might be missing. Uh, let's see. So that's the question, right? So what's missing on the previous fiction, right? What is missing? And I wrote an article about that. I, I, when I share the slides, you, you can click on the links there that I'm providing uh, further. Um, but yeah, somebody said uh, civil society, right? Yeah, exactly. Right? So civil society. So if you look at what is what I call the complete picture of an ecosystem, uh, you see the, the, the not the yellow, but the, the, the yellow, yes, the yellow, the yellow bubble. The philanthropy and social impact that, that is just not represented right now. We're not being represented in the tables of where academia, private sector, and other sectors are there, and it, but we're not. And so uh, civil society, philanthropy, social impact, we need to make sure that the ecosystem is complete. Not only because to be included is the right thing, just on, it, on, on its own without any excuse, but also because we may have something of value that as a very important sector of the society that is not included to give to the shaping of AI as well. So yeah, it's, it's a win-win scenario. I mean, we, we need to do it. It's, it's not done, it's just a problem, right? So kind of shifting gears. So that was just a little, um, a little bit into like Canada, was the Canadian situation. And now let's look at, let's go back into the international uh, aspect of AI, which is, I think is the, you need to take that into, into, into account. In the last couple of months, uh, most specifically on May, uh, on June of this year, starting with the release of ChatGPT 4.0, uh, May 13th, I believe. Yes, May 13th. I don't think correct me, but it was a, it was a Monday and it was in May, middle of May, May 13th. Let's go with that. Um, ChatGPT 4.0 got released and of course has been released. Right, an important component that was probably the most important part of that uh, showcase that OpenAI did was their new voice model, right? The Chat GPT for all voice, right? The omnipresent voice. But right now we don't have that voice. We have the model, we have the large language model that has been up, uh, optimized with new benchmarks of of capability, but we haven't yet received that special voice that we heard. That some people said that's like Scarlett Johansson, right? And then Scarlett Johansson took, took a little bit of a, a problem with that and, you know, <laughs> losses and whatever. And so they, they had to remove the, uh, the voice that sounded like, kind of sounded like Scarlett Johansson, the sky voice that they have to remove. But whatever, that's besides the point, right? That's the least, the least of the important things to think about when it comes to, uh, I think the important thing is that Soon after the release of ChatGPT 4.0, a bunch of people just started to leave, starting with uh, the head of alignment. So alignment being like that word for safety when it comes to AI, right? Safe AI. Uh, the head of alignment, uh, Jan Leakey, Leakey, I think that's how you say his name, uh, left the day after, uh, wait a second, no, three days after, sorry. Just confusing it. And then Ilya Saskaber, who's the co-founder of AI, because everybody knows Sam Alman. Yeah, it's the face. But the other one, the co-founder of AI is Ilya Saskaber. And Ilya Saskaber was uh, a PhD student out of UFT, University of Toronto. Uh, as of like 2012, 2013, was under Geoffrey Hinton, who is the godfather of AI, who was just president at the coalition conference. I actually got a little bit of a, a word exchange with him, tiny. Uh, he didn't want to take a picture with me, but that's okay. Um, and he was there at the coalition. And, and that's Geoffrey Hinton is, you know, the 
Canadian uh, British uh, UFT professor uh, who has been the UFT professor recognized in the computer science department who advanced um, a lot of work in neural network and uh, neural network type of research, so machine learning neural network. Uh, and he had as his, te- as his student, um, uh, Ilya Saskover, who is also like Canadian, he has Canadian citizenship, so he is Canadian, but he's also American and he's also, uh, I believe, Israeli as well, I believe. I, I don't know. I, I, I know that he lives, he, he likes to go there, but I don't know if he's from there, so I can't say. Um, but anyways, um, there's been a bunch of people living, and then the question is like, why would we be living? Why would they be living, right? So before going into why they would be living, let's talk, let's hear about Geoffrey Hinton now. Like recently, he's been on the news, been back on the news lately because you will remember Geoffrey Hinton was very present for people almost months after ChatGPT 3.5 got released, and then we heard then how he came out and he said like, you know. I used to work at the DeepMind Google Lab with the advanced AI research, and I I left it. And now that I left it, I can talk about it, right? So it's like talking about existential dress and stuff. But it's more than that. So let's let's listen to it. In the spring of 2023, last year, um, I began to realize that these digital intelligences we're building might just be a lot better form of intelligence than, than us. And we had to take seriously the idea they were going to get smarter than us, and maybe within the next 20 years or so. And so we needed now to think seriously about, could we control them? Before that, I thought it would be much longer, and so we didn't need to worry about it right now. And many people still think they're just statistical tricks and they don't really understand what they're saying. I think that's quite wrong. So I came out and focused on the existential threat, that is, the idea that they'll take over from people. Um, because many people were saying it was science fiction, and I no longer believe it's science fiction. Nobody really knows. We've never confronted this before. We've never had to deal with things more intelligent than us. And so people are very, people should be very uncertain about what it's going to look like. And it would seem very wise to do lots of empirical experiments when it's slightly less smart than us, so we still have a chance of staying in control. And I think that's a lot of the debate at OpenAI. The people interested in safety, like Ilya Sutskova, wanted significant resources to be spent on safety. People interested in profits, like Sam Altman, didn't want to spend too many resources on that. My view of how things ought to be organized is um, capitalism's produced a lot of goods for us. The people trying to make money are very inventive. That's fine as long as there's regulations that stop their inventiveness um, leading to very bad things. So, for example, um, big pharmaceutical companies, they shouldn't be allowed to peddle addictive drugs, particularly, say, they're not addictive. Um, Big oil companies shouldn't be allowed to produce all that carbon dioxide. We need government regulation to make sure that in, in developing new stuff to make profits, we don't also develop harmful things. Uh, I mean, it's it's a lot, right? And, and he really connects the dots uh, pretty well, uh, from my belief. Uh, I would say, like, it's not surprising to hear that I'm more of his camp <laughs> of things. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it, it, I always like to hear him talk because um, I hear it and I was like, yes, 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 I align so well. Uh, and, you know, like, he at least has unlike me, the privilege of have been actually seeing some things in, at, a, at a very deep level, right? This is the godfather of AI, right? Maybe we need to take him a little bit seriously, like, was he saying these things? Like, is it worth it? Maybe? Things. So, so yeah, moving on from there, right? Mention mentioned OpenAI. Uh, this is OpenAI's, like, the profile, right? So you can see very clearly that sole purpose of OpenAI is to create AGI, right? AGI, which is the AI that can reason and think and be autonomous, right? Function, can be function as autonomous. Uh, but that's their sole vision. That's their sole, this is their goal. This is what they want to do. This is, every, everything is geared towards that, that end goal. And so some of these people have come out, and like I said, some of them are whistleblowers. Um, uh, 
Uh, yes, I'm, I'm just laughing because I had um, a podcast before where I did it in Spanish and I was talking about the word whistleblower. And if somebody speaks Spanish here, uh, you, <laughs> if you will translate uh, with, or if you translate the word whistleblower literally in Spanish, it'll be, it could be funny if you don't do it properly. And I, I made a mistake of making it a funny way and then probably I'm going to end up in the, in the real somewhere. People <laughs> putting me in sound like a, yeah, like somebody stupid anyways um yeah so all these people have come out uh, from uh, open ai and some from google as well we don't have a full picture but everybody here is open ai except for the last two on the right and it's geoffrey hinton and this joshua banjo which is another respected authority in ai that's uh on quebec and montreal so two canadians right big stars so when Jan Lick, which is the head of alignment of the head of safety, left uh, on May 17th, a couple of days after uh, May 13th, where the ChatGPT 4 left, left this on his X account. Uh, building smarter than human machines is a inherently dangerous endeavor. Uh, open AI is shouldering an enormous responsibility on behalf of all humanity. Uh, over the past four years, safety and cultural processes have taken a backseat to shiny products. That's the same thing that uh, you're thinking just said, right? Exactly. So just a little bit of review is like talking about alignment and I keep saying safety. It's not exactly that, but like, that's just the easiest way to understand it. It's like, it's, it's creating a practice that is going to ensure that AI innovation and AI deployments are not going to be harmful to humans, basically. That you're not just teaching it things for the sake of teaching things. And I also think this also should include seeing just like, like eventually the government is going to want to take it and apply. I mean, it, I mean, it already is happening. You will, you will see, but, um, just how harmful can AI augment weapons that get, that use AI and what do we need to put in, in measures there as a practice to make sure that it's not as harmful. All right. So one of the things that, um, Geoffrey Hinder said at Collision, which is the video that you didn't see, this, this is a different one. I, I saw his presentation and he would talk about the little autonomous weapons, right? That's the term, little autonomous weapons. And so that's, that's just a, an idea of, you know, what, what is it that we need to put in place to ensure that the machines are, are not as distracted as they can be basically. So these people have come out and they write, written a letter, an open letter. And as you can see on the right, there's former uh, employees from the OpenAI majority, uh, and then uh, some who are from Google. So, and then signatories are Geoffrey Hinton and Joshua Banjo as, as well as someone who's also a respected figure in AI. So just warning us that, you know, uh, these things are advancing, that we need to involve the society, the civil society, and they actually said civil society. So, it's smart people, right? Like they should listen to this. We should be, I think, need to be a little bit more wary of what, what, what this is. This is June 4th. It just came out, right? So one of those people that was previously in the pictures is um, a former employee who wrote a 165-page uh, series of papers that all talk about, you know, what, how, what is it that we need to consider when it comes to AGI and the next phases of AI uh, developments. So I'm going to just read it very quickly, like not the whole thing, just the beginning. We need to not screw it up. Recognizing the power of superintelligence also means recognizing its peril. There are very safety risk, very real risk, and it's always wrong whether because, because mankind uses destructive power brought for our own annihilation or because, yes, the alien species we're summoning is one of them we cannot fully control. Alien species in reference to AI, by the way, because some people have actually said this is not artificial intelligence, this is alien intelligence. So, and then the other thing he says is that AG, by, by 2027, uh, AGI is very, very plausible. And then she just went into the comparisons of, you know, how we gone from where we were just a couple of years ago to now, and the, the level was speeding up. So he predicts that 2027 is when we'll see uh, AGI. Another development that happened is that after these people left, a lot of them were in the alignment department, the safety department. The 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 LPN of course form a new uh, safety department. And in, who do you find there in the group? Among them, Sam Alman, <laughs> right? 
and that is like the analogy is like if if you have like a farm you're a pharmaceutical like you have a, a, a something that you created but you're also the one that advises what is safe as a drug and what is not like you, you cannot have that like, but only in ai we have this because it's such a new thing and laws and regulations are not keeping up it's a lot of getting away with kind of stuff no this shouldn't happen you know and then the other thing that's worrying is that one of the members of that safety or alignment committee is actually a former nsa general so the paper that that uh Ashen, uh what's his name <laughs> uh, let's say the pronounce ashen brenner has published uh, the series of papers published warns about the eventual involvement of government right in, in the near future so we're already kind of seeing this we're already seeing this play out in front of us and then after Ilya left uh, OpenAI as a chief scientist right he's the biggest probably like the most important person in terms of innovation of AI yeah, we think of a ChatGPT that he's behind it so and he just went into form his own company called Super Intelligence INC or SSI um not long ago since he left, right? So, so he, he tweeted this out saying like, super intelligence is within reach. So remember, we're not talking about AGI is within reach. He's now going a step further, right? He's not like, he's not looking at the next wave because honestly, likely we're already here. We just, the public doesn't get access to it, right? But what if, what if ChatGPT 4 all is actually already AGI? And do you think like, do you think if OpenAI attains AGI, they will just say our next model is going to have AGI, just so you know? No, they're not going to say it. Because there are so many uh, philosophical things that will happen that humanity needs to prepare for. Things need to be put in place for such a shift that you can't just, I don't think you would just announce it, right? Like, oh, our next model has AGI plus. <laughs> no, I don't think it's going to be announced. And so therefore, I think it's possible that AGI is already here even. And that's why Ilya is talking about the next level up. We're not talking just AGI anymore. We're talking about the next level. Uh, so yes, like I said, maybe maybe AGI is already here and, and we're starting to see some signs of, you know, use of AI in, in ways that may be a little bit concerning. Let's look at the video from... Uh, uh, here at the Goldman Canada in Ottawa, uh, CBC report about federal offices testing out this new robot. So let's, let's, let's see. Public servants first spotted the new visitor in March, prowling around office buildings in Gatineau, Quebec. They called it the little robot. The federal government says there's nothing to fear, but one union president has his suspicions. He wonders whether it's checking attendance. Folks say, you know, why is there a robot here? Doesn't my employer trust that I'm here and doing my work properly? Why do, why is this, this robot strolling around? He says employees feel watched and some call the robot a spy. It's part of the Verbrix platform designed by Global DWS. Co-founder Yaya Saad says the robot cannot check attendance since it doesn't even know who it's looking at. It's not a spy because, as I mentioned, there's no uh, personally identifiable information that's being captured. He says the robot is part of an occupancy scanning solution that uses a 360 degree camera and AI. The camera takes the picture, analyzes and counts the number of people and then discards the image. Uh, I laugh because it's like, oh, it's okay. The, the camera takes the data, but doesn't actually do anything with what it's taking. So then what's, isn't that a waste of resource to record something, but you're not going to use it? So I don't know. It just doesn't make sense to me. But anyways, um, <laughs> another example. Now this one, this one I haven't fully corroborated, I gotta admit. But if it is true, what it says, I think it's super concerning and we need to take note of this. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The Israeli publications Plus 972 magazine and Local Call have exposed how the Israeli military used art artificial intelligence, known as lavender, to develop a kill list in Gaza that includes as many as 37,000 Palestinians who are targeted for assassination with little human oversight. The report is based in part on interviews with six Israeli intelligence officers who'd firsthand involvement with the AI 
AI system. 972 reports, quote, Lavender has played a central role in the unprecedented bombing of Palestinians, especially during the early stages of the war. In fact, according to the sources, its influence on the military's operations was such that they essentially treated the outputs of the AI machine as if it were a human decision. Yeah, so if that's true, isn't that like, isn't that like really like Terminator already? Like, how is that not a machine that is uses AI to kill all the people? Like, yeah. But yeah, it's very concerning if it's true. This is, um, yeah, so there's different type of data coming out all the time. Uh, this is a Citibank doing a report about uh, banking uh, being what they see. We, they're the ones doing this, the, the research, and they're the ones that I was like, imagine like they're surprised. Um, but yeah, banking is, uh, is at risk of, of cutting half of all jobs. And, and banking, especially in Canada, I think we need to be worried, right? Because one of the biggest things in Canada is banking. So yeah, that, that would translate into a lot of jobs. And also, I don't have, I, I do have the report, I would have shown it, but there was another report by Evidence, Evidence AI, which is a, a, an institution that does uh, evaluations for banking and AI implementation. And they rank the Royal Bank of Canada in position number three only after uh, JP Morgan and another one of those big banks. So the third one being Canada in terms of AI implementation. So we believe like, at least for that aspect of things, we are leading from that something, right? And there's a number of other uh, cyber threats and threats that are predicted to take note of that uh, this organization called the European uh, Union Agency for Cybersecurity has just released uh, when it comes to the next phase in the next couple of years. And I'm not going to go over them, but you can see like, some of them are, you know, a little bit new, maybe no, not so common. Crossword that ICT service providers as a single point of failure. Yeah, what does that mean exactly? So yeah, a couple of new things. And now what we have here is another event, another event related to politics and how AI is playing. How many times have you heard this one? A politician wanting to reinvent politics. Hi, I'm AI Steve, standing to be MP for Brighton and Hove. But what happens when the candidate is the actual invention? Meet Steve, that is, AI, Steve. An avatar on the ballot, a UK first. You're actively dangerous. Dangerous? You think the public can't be trusted? It may feel like something out of that dystopian Black Mirror episode where a comedian uses a computer-generated avatar to cause electoral chaos. But now it's happening in real life, sort of, with AI Steve running as an independent. AI Steve, was Brexit a good idea? Brexit is a complex issue with varied opinions. He can dodge a question like a real politician, but AI Steve will do exactly what his constituents tell it to do in Parliament, according to its creator, Steve Endicott. Yeah, so we're not going to let him speak because I cut the clip right there. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it, it's out of that uh, Black Mirror series, right? Like Netflix, we've seen the Black Mirror series in Netflix, yeah. Uh, kind of dystopian type of things happening right now, right? Like, the, honestly, it's in science fiction, to be honest. Sometimes I see this, like, is this the fake altogether right now? Like, like there's no way, yeah, but it's happening. How many? Expect that. And then we'll, let's see what uh, Donald Trump, who's been interviewed very recently as well, has been saying. I've seen things that are so, you wouldn't even think it's possible. But in terms of copycat, now, to a lesser extent, they can make a commercial. I saw this. Yeah. They made a commercial, me promoting a product, and it wasn't me. And I said, did I make that commercial? <laughs> did I forget that I made that commercial? It is so unbelievable. So it brings with it difficulty, but we have to be at the forefront. It's going to happen. And if it's going to happen, we have to take the lead over China. China is the primary threat in terms of that. And you know what they need more than anything else is electricity. They have to have electricity, massive amounts of electricity. I don't know if you know that. In order to do these, essentially, it's a plant. And the electricity needs are greater than anything we've ever needed before to do AI at the highest level. And China will produce it because they'll do whatever you have to do, whereas we have environmental impact people, and you know we have a lot of people trying to hold us back. But uh, 
massive amounts of electricity are needed in order to do AI. And we're going to have to generate a whole different level of uh, energy. And we can do it, and I think we should do it. But we have to be very careful with it. Right? We have to watch mm. it. But it's, uh, you know, the words you use were exactly right. It's the words a lot of smart people are using. Uh, you know, there are those people that say it takes over, it takes over the human race. It's really powerful stuff, mm. AI. Mm. Yeah, indeed, right? Uh, so yeah, what do you catch as being the most important thing here is the, oh, well, not the one, but the, the most impactful thing what you said is the energy production, right? So you saw the video with NVIDIA, looking at all the stocks and the AI factories. If you're scaling up AI factories or the stacks of, of chips and, and infrastructure, you're going to need indeed to get to the levels of AGI or super intelligence are going to be devastatingly higher than now. And what is that going to translate to? I've seen that. It's going to translate to, right? Like in terms of climate change and the, and the, and the recent high temperatures that people have been dying by the thousands, I think, in Mecca, hundreds of thousands or something like that. Uh, who knows? Uh, yeah, thousands, yeah. Something crazy, like all around the world, like all these te temperatures that keep increase, increasing, they go up to like 45 to 50. People are dying just by that. Um, and so what is going to happen when we consume twice as much as we did before? When our energy demands are so much higher? We're going to be burning a lot of coal and things that harm the environment. Fossil fuels are going to get burning because not everything can be powered with electricity alone. So you need to find everything that's possible, right? So, yeah, that should be worrying. So let's talk about a little bit uh, what super intelligence is. So I said, like, it started with artificial intelligence at the bottom, and then you grow up one step higher, being AGI, one step higher, being super intelligence. But it means that at the point in which AGI will be created, which I believe that it will be in a couple of years, maybe less so, <laughs> or it's already here. Um, once that happens, AGI will just scale up. It's going to multiply, and it's going to get, we're going to put together 100 AGIs, which is like digital people, if you want to call it that. And what is that huge amounts of concentration of intelligence going to do? It's going to create super intelligence. And that's the point. That's the point. So super intelligence is the capacity to solve the most craziest of the problems that we have, like the environment. You know, how do we solve that? How do we cure cancer, etc.? cetera? Uh, but it also has the power to maybe destroy us. So uh, that... Ilya, explain what super intelligence is. Now, what is super intelligence? Why did we choose to use the term super intelligence? The reason is that super intelligence is meant to convey something that's not just like an AGI. With AGI, we said, well, you have something that's kind of like a person, kind of like a coworker. Super intelligence is meant to convey something far more capable than that. Mm -hmm. When you have such a capability, it's like, can we even imagine how it will be? But without question, it's going to be unbelievably powerful. It could be used to solve incomprehensibly hard problems if it is used well, if we navigate the challenges that superintelligence pose, poses. We could, we could radically improve the quality of life. But the power of superintelligence is so vast. So the concerns. The concern number one has been expressed a lot, and this is the scientific problem of alignment. Mm -hmm. You might want to think of it from the, as, an, as an analog to nuclear safety. You know, you build a nuclear reactor. You want to get the energy. You need to make sure that it won't melt down, even if there's an earthquake, and even if someone tries to, I don't know, smash a truck into it. Yep. So this is the superintelligence safety, and it must be addressed in order to contain the vast power of superintelligence. I want to believe him more than uh, I would believe uh, I, I Sam Alman, but um, I don't know. It's just uh, it's just so big of a concept to uh, to just trust people with it. No. Uh, and then here is the CTO of OpenAI, Mira Murati, who was uh, at an event in Darwin University. So this is again just happened, right? Like this is June twenty second. So let's see. They ask her about like where does he where does she see the future, like in the near future. So let's see what she says. How intelligent is this going to get? I mean, it sounds yeah. like your description is the scaling of this is pretty linear. Mm -hmm. um, you add more of those elements and it gets smarter. Yeah. Um, how quickly has, has it gotten smarter, ChatGPT, in the last couple of years? And what is, how quickly will it get to 
you know, maybe human level intelligence. So yeah, these these systems are already human level in specific tasks, um, and of course, in a lot of tasks they're not. If you look at the trajectory of improvement, um, systems like GPT-3 were maybe, uh, let's say, you know, toddler level intelligence, and then systems like GPT-4 are more like smart high schooler intelligence. Um, and then in the next couple of years, we're looking at PhD level intelligence for specific tasks. Um, like. So things are changing and improving pretty rapidly. Meaning like a year from now? Yeah, a year and a half, let's say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a year, a year and a half. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's laugh about that. Like, I don't know, that look to me looks like she knows something that we don't. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not hiding anything, right? It's like, yeah, I'm still happening. Come on, talk. Um, yeah, so th a couple more concepts. I think this is the last concept that I'm going to put here, but this is uh, called the concept of public interest technology, which means it's an approach that was set out to ensure that, you know, we, Utilize uh, technology uh, in implementations in, in, in so for social good, for public good. Uh, always keeping in mind of the responsible creation of it um, and usage. So, in tandem with the concept of alignment, right? So it's it's kind of like the, the the philosophy or the the best thing to do, honestly, uh, when it comes to this current situation. So uh, it needs to be put into practice, and the, the issue is that it doesn't. It takes a backseat. Uh, yeah, so this is just a summary of um, of the progression in which we uh, we have been, uh, we are, and according to like a data that I have gathered from you know the papers and the, the whistleblowers, the testimonials, most likely 2027, 2028, we're gonna see the big jump, uh, which you might say officially is AGI, or in the progression of things, the PhD level student or coworker, right? Like, Another way of saying it's just the progression, right? So you can see like the sizes, I try to progressively go with the, the baby, the toddler, <laughs> the baby, baby AI, cute, all the way to like, it's the same scale as a human, right? So, so yeah. And yeah, we have another video here from, I think it's the final video from Nick Frost, who is the co-founder of Cohere. So Cohere is the AI company in, in Canada, the only one that is, has some kind of presence. It's not at the top, like, you know, the Google and whatever, but like it's we're around <laughs> and they ask actually about, you know, this, about AGI and about, about what they do. So let's see what he thinks. Yeah. So I think when a company says that they're interested in, they're going after AGI, they're describing a technology that does not exist yet, right? They're describing some future world in which there are computers that you treat as a person or that are, you know, go even beyond the capabilities of a person or, you know, those sci-fi visions of artificial super intelligence and all these things. If a company says they're going after AGI, they're saying that's what they're trying to build. I actually, it's unclear to me that the technology we have now will get us there. I, I don't, I don't really care about that. I'm interested and Cohere is interested in making large language models useful for businesses. Yeah, so of course, I, I, I'm in a disagreement. Um, I think you should care about the possibility that this might be true, especially when it comes from people who have been, uh, you know, uh, the front lines of seeing with what, what is happening and what lastly they have seen things that we haven't seen yet. So I would trust them. I would trust the testimonials and, and the letter and the, and, and the the warnings that they're giving us. So I, I don't, I, I, I think one of the things that I would like to do is to, to ask Nick directly. Hopefully I will. Um, and yeah, so we'll see. That's what I feel. And then there's a perspective from the, uh, French president Macron, and he was interviewed in May by CNBC and yeah, they asked him about how he thinks about AI. So let's, let's listen just very shortly. Referring to AI, we can, we can revert on that because AI is not just a sector. This is a huge revolution. And it will completely transform the existing sector, but it will transform education, democracy, work, a lot of things. 
And, uh, and I think our, our challenge for AI is accelerate, innovate, and invest. And on the other side, regulating right. at the appropriate scale, meaning the global one. I, I think, I mean, looking at what Macron has been doing for the last couple of years, uh, the, the level of investment in, in the infrastructure, uh, the model Mistral, which is what they have in, in France, Mistral AI, who's received billions of dollars of funding in partnership with Microsoft recently. It's, it's kind of like, it's, it's been working for them. I think it's like, they, I, I feel that they've done, of course, not everything has been perfect, but they've done certain things now that it's putting them somewhere in the map than other countries are, that only usually is China and the United States, um, pretty much. And, but what is in the space of AI, where is like France and all the G7 countries, right? Where's Canada, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, so there's some things to, to, um, to learn from what, what's been happening in France, right? Like the investment on, on Mistral, their AI model. Why don't we do that here with Cohere, right? If Nick, if you're hearing me, uh, I advocate for Cohere to get the same level of attention and funding and support that France has given to Mistral. So that will be my take on it. And some predictions, like you got the OECD has done some uh, sort of projection. The Center for Productivity and Prosperity has done some projections in terms of like living standards. And if just looking at the last couple of decades, just looking at Canada, uh, declined from the spots and what could be a further decline if nothing is changed in terms of, you know, what are we in terms of productivity? What are we in terms of innovation? Uh, and if things don't get solved now, we're going to have a big pro bigger problem in the future. So my final thought, like Jerry Springer's final thought is today is to, uh, that is worrying, that this situation is worrying. I think from my perspective, uh, we would require to have a bigger collaboration, a bigger sense of coming together and advance this work as a, as a unit and, and not work in silos. And because we need to do this now, because if you don't do this now, when are we going to do it? Maybe it's true that Geoffrey Hinton says that let's do this now while we can, because maybe later we won't be able to. <laughs> so you better just, it's not even a matter of like, in concept it's nice, but it's like, it's the smart thing to do is to maybe, and what would be the downside if, if everything, you know, the doomsayers is wrong? What would be the downside? That we are over prepared and over preparedness is a bad thing. I don't think so. So why not, why not make sure that we have the right approach? We have a complete ecosystem. And then with that higher understanding, better connection, better working together, we have a way, a strategy that is very comprehensive that it can actually do something now that it, it can prevent a very um, negative scenario, which is, I'm not just talking about robot, robots shooting everybody, killing everybody. But I'm just talking about, um, missing out on an opportunity to, to use it, to really harness it, to, to do something really, to solve the, like, no more hunger, no more cancer. Instead, the opposite might be like, you know, overusing it on warfare and like we saw the potential of that. Um, biological weapons, like, who knows, like, you can go, et cetera, with the types of things that we can do, but like, we need to take action now. So that is my final thought. And I'm going to close in with, some animations of uh, a model that I use called Luma or Dream Machine, Luma AI. You can put a prompt and it will create a five second animation. So in this case, I created that and took maybe two minutes to do this. If I would have done before AI, these models that we have now, it would have taken me hours to reproduce something like this. Amazing, simple animation. Uh, how about this? You think this is simpler? No, like it's not simple at all, but this was done with AI and it's just a prompt and you, know, you waited two, two minutes and got generated. So, uh, yeah, let's talk about productivity, right? And, and, and saving time, something that now they used to take me hours, now take me three minutes. So, uh, big time productivity. So yeah, so that's the end of my speech, uh, my dog, uh, if you want to connect, people want to connect with me, you can email me, uh, you can scan the code, but the emphasis here is like. We're facing uh, a worrying time, uh, and it's very important to to come together and do things um, more comprehensively because the issue that we're living is sort of uncomprehensible. We need to really do do things and take this these warnings and this whistle blow seriously and take action and take preventative action so we don't get anything bad outcome to happen. So 
that's it on my talk. We're not gonna run out of time, but um, yeah, I'm gonna leave it here. <laughs>